Our lectionary today offers powerful stories around the origins of Jewish law and a description of the extraordinary event we call the Transfiguration of the Christ. And these are each so rich in possible meanings that they actually give us the chance to excavate and explore meaning itself. What is meaning exactly? What role does it play in our lives? And why is pursuing it not merely worthwhile, but maybe the most important thing we can do in the time that we have? And not incidentally, what is the cost of not seeking and finding it in the unfolding of our lives? Given that meaning is so subjective to everyone's experience, dictionary definitions are pretty useless. They either simply use various forms of the word to define itself or offer representations of, well, what it means. So I'm going to just offer a working definition this morning, and you can tell me what you think about it. Meaning is our bulwark against the suffering and tragedy of life. Meaning is our bulwark against the tragedy and suffering of life. Of course, the idea at the root of every ancient religious tradition is that life is suffering. That may as well be a direct quote from Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, born 600 years before Jesus. And certainly, Christ's willingness to take on the vulnerability of mortality and accept his excruciating crucifixion forms the bedrock and doorway into this Christ experience we've been trying to understand for millennia. Maybe you're dealing with the death or loss of a loved one or a grave injury to yourself or someone you care deeply about. Or there's a calamity in your family or work life. Or perhaps you're just wrestling with, in the words of Jason Isbell, I think maybe the greatest living American songwriter, the great fog of loneliness, the devil's own disguise. And if it's not you, someone you love is most likely really taking it on the chin. And even if things are going great right now, just you wait, right? No one gets off easy and nobody gets out alive. Undergirding the beautiful and inspiring and comforting experiences of life is this incontrovertible truth. And despite our culture's frantic attempts to distract us, deep down, everybody knows it. And then add to that the presence of malevolence and the unspeakable cruelty human beings are capable of inflicting upon one another, and you get a pretty stark picture of what we are all dealing with. So what do we do about it? Well, pretty much every religious tradition offers a similar remedy. Uh, <laughs> uh, offers a similar remedy. Seek, find, and create meaning. Irrespective of the suggestions of religion, though, you know this intuitively. What is the most positive thing that can come from the death of a family member? Better and more loving relationships with the living. What is the most positive thing that can come out of a profound injury, setback, or loss? The gathering of one's spirit and the overcoming of adversity to create something better, even a new life call it a resurrection. Just think about the people you truly admire. Aren't they those who overcome great difficulties and triumph in spite of overwhelming odds or danger? It's every hero story or movie you've ever seen. The world knelt at the feet of Nelson Mandela. Why? Because in 27 years of prison, he extracted the meaning of what it is to be a wise human being and was thus forged into a leader of humanity. Almost everyone we truly admire are those who reach into the muck and despair and pain of life and wrench from it strength and a victory over the past. That's meaning and the power of meaning. Of course, there is an alternative response to life's inevitable and continual pain and suffering. 
you can become bitter and resentful. And it's extreme, just ask those people shooting up schools or people in public places or even their own families. Or just creating mayhem in other people's lives out of spite. Or maybe it just becomes resignation and loss of the vitality and hope that foster life's sweetness and joy. Okay, so what does this have to do with Moses and God's law? I think a lot of us harbor a very cinematic picture of God carving the tablets of the Ten Commandments for Moses with a finger of fire or something like that. But I think we're asked to think about this in a more sophisticated way. The Israelites wandered around in a desert somewhere between Elam on the eastern shore of the Red Sea and Mount Sinai. Look at a map. It's actually a pretty small desert. What the heck were they doing for 40 bloody years? Well, consider that they have just escaped a tyranny that would have prescribed every single aspect of their lives and are suddenly cast into freedom. What were they doing for 40 years? Arguing, squabbling, fighting, probably at each other's throats. For anyone who has ever been a parent, run a company, or a church, or led any kind of group, beyond trying to maintain a vision, you know that adjudicating arguments and trying to settle disagreements is mostly the job. So that's probably what Moses was doing every day, all day, for decades. Judging between competing claims, accusations, trying to eradicate false idols, developing wisdom in order to properly prepare these former slaves for true freedom. And what was wisdom in this case? Wisdom was that which made peace and created functioning relationships among squabbling people. So when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive the revelation of the law, which by the way took him 40 days and nights, what he brought back was simply a codification of what they had already been doing for 40 years of struggle. What, now you might ask, does this have to do with meaning? Well, if you want to live a meaningful life, with relationships that properly function, stop lying. Don't steal or even envy what doesn't belong to you or that you didn't work for. Don't cross lines with other people's partners or your own. Honor your mother and father who, no matter what else, gave you life. Take some time each week, maybe each day, to be grateful and acknowledge the gift of this existence and the opportunities that it lays out before you every day, whether you see them or not. To perhaps even say, thank you for everything. Oh, and don't murder people. That's a good one. This extraordinary law transmitted through Moses developed over decades of learning how to make peace among troublesome humans, literally laid the moral foundation stone for the entire Western civilization that we all enjoy today. Not bad in the realm of what is meaningful, which propels us right into our gospel, where Peter, James, and John accompany Jesus up Mount Sinai and witness something extraordinary. They see Jesus standing with the spirits of Moses, the great prophet of the law, and Elijah, the great defender of the worship and miracles of God. And suddenly Jesus is illuminated with an impossibly bright and pure light, and they hear the voice of God acknowledging him, the only time other than his baptism when this happens. And the disciples freak. Now, in discussions of this, perhaps understandably, the focus is usually on what is happening with Jesus and the prophets. But I think this misses the essential point for us. I don't know about you, but I've never been a prophet or a messiah, so I'm rather limited in my insight on the metaphysics of it all. But I have been and remain a stumbling, bumbling, half-witted seeker 
just trying to get a handle on this Christ experience. It's pretty safe to say that in all these stories with the disciples, we're them. These rough, smelly, working-class fishermen are very near the bottom rung of an oppressed people in this first-century Roman-occupied backwater of Judea. And Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, another hick from the backwater, incidentally, they have discovered not just meaning, but in him for them ultimate meaning. And what do they do? They follow it wherever it leads. In this case, up a mountain. Often, maybe always, it really takes something, sometimes a real sacrifice even, to pursue the great prize of that which is most meaningful. And for this, they were rewarded with a vision of pure clarity and light. Jesus is the bulwark, the buttress for them against the pain, uncertainty, and fear that they, just like every one of us, confronts in this fragile, vulnerable existence. So the question is, where does meaning lie for you? Well, certainly it's for each of us to discover. Maybe it's partly in our families, or work, or church. But beyond that, it may be something announcing itself to you as truly worthwhile, and not just for you. Very likely, pursuing meaning has something to do with serving others. Incidentally, the final and ultimate message of the Christ. Maybe it's big. Maybe it's small. I just read about a hard-working farmer in Indiana who found out that many of his rural neighbors couldn't afford their prescription drugs. So he started giving an envelope full of cash each month to the local pharmacist, telling her, if anybody needs help paying for their drugs, no matter who, use this. And he insisted that no one know it was him. One of his neighbors, a mother, has a son with a fatal allergy to bees and discovered that she simply couldn't afford the cost of an EpiPen. When the pharmacist told her that an anonymous donor was covering the cost, she wept. That's meaning. And when the farmer recently died and his daughter found out about it, he had never even mentioned it to her, she decided to continue his generosity. It makes you feel good just to hear about that, doesn't it? But why? I'll conclude on a personal note. The Episcopal Church has designated this last Sunday of the Epiphany as World Mission Sunday. Too often, I think, we in the West regard world mission as a chance for us, those apparently on top of things economically with abundant resources, to go out and help those poor, deprived, underprivileged masses out there. If that's the case, I think, again, we're missing the essence of the experience. We ourselves are part of the world in desperate need of the evangelizing spirit of God to help set us right and set us on the path of what matters. In our own frailty, ignorance, and brokenness, no matter our station, we need the truth and wisdom offered by other human beings' experience, especially those living in very different circumstances than our own. In late 2014, I was a priest in a small parish in Pennsylvania. And one day, a parishioner out of the blue opened the life and world of the Christians in Iraq to me, just as the ISIS catastrophe was exploding. It's true, our relationships in that amazing country have allowed us to help farmers and others revitalize their businesses and livelihoods after excruciating years, decades, centuries of war and conflict. And that's good. But the deeper truth is that this gift of my friendships in Iraq have brought more meaning and goodness into my life than anything I can ever do for anyone over there or anywhere else. It's made my life 
full and meaningful in ways I could never have imagined. So my friends, as we move into the season of Lent, the time of deepest reflection and hopefully openness in our church year, there's an open invitation. What might it be for you? What might bring a new and unexpected sense of purpose and meaning into your existence? So to bring forth your light and so feed the life of the world. In the name of God, amen.